Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NASJ podcast. My name is Tobias Matei. I'm the deputy editor of the North American Spine Society Journal, and I have the pleasure of having with me today Dr. Aza Peterson and Dr. Howard Place. Uh, they are the authors of an article published recently published on NASJ entitled Isolated Thoracic and Lumbar Transverse Process Fractures. Do they need spine surgeon evaluation? A high volume level one trauma center experience with cost analysis. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Place and Dr. Peterson. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having us. Would you like to give a brief introduction uh, of you, uh, of your practice, Dr. Place, and, and maybe also Dr. Peterson? I know you're a resident heading toward a, a, spine, of, a spine fellowship. So just to give you an idea uh, of how this paper came about. Sure. So I'll go ahead and start. So I'm a, uh, an orthopedic spine surgeon. I've been at St. Louis University for uh, over 26 years, and it's a, uh, a high volume level one trauma center. During that period of time, there's a lot of folks who get um, who get evaluated with uh, pan CTs, and uh, sometimes there's just very incidental findings of a transverse process fracture in isolation. And uh, because they had any type of spine injury, the spine service would then be consulted to do that. And we recognized that most of those patients really did not need any care, um, and so it became something that was basically a, a time sump. Uh, there where it would take time to go and evaluate folks and also a cost sump uh, there when other studies may or may not be done. And then patients weren't getting mobilized and uh, they also would, uh, their discharges would be delayed waiting for the spine consultant to come by to say that, yes, this is uh, something that did make a difference. So I think that's some of the background about um, how, how this all started. Hey, yeah, so. perfect. And one of the things I'm curious, Dr. Place, and you know more about the history uh, of SLU and how this all started, because I'm curious, there, there's a, one publication you cite, for example, I think it's from 2008, uh, and it was already good evidence showing that isolated thoracic and lumbar TP fractures did not need spinal consultation. Uh, and I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that at SLU, maybe this started because there were some unrecognized sacral fractures, which is something that we know are associated with TP fracture, and that was the reason for the current protocol. But, but walk me through that historically, why our uh, St. Louis University is a little bit different than most level one trauma centers uh, in which these pathologies are not, do not require spine surgery consultation. Yeah, so I guess I would tell you that I don't know that the, um, that the paper you referenced, that we referenced there, uh, actually uh, was as well recognized and appreciated. Plus the fact that, uh, as, as you know, uh, sometimes new information uh, doesn't seem to be accepted readily, especially when there's a history of uh, things being done a certain way. Uh, and we've had a, a lot of uh, turnover, both in uh, different trauma leaders over time. And uh, that has, uh, and someone comes from another institution and they say, no, 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 we have to go ahead and get every one of these seen and evaluated. And I would suggest to you that it wasn't until we actually had enough of a, uh, of a challenge problem and enough people to kind of say we're wasting time that we could relook at this and people then wanted evidence. And so that's why we re repeated the study. Okay, I understand. And this is a unique study because I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the first one in the literature that present uh, comprehensive cost um, analysis of the consultation and additional imaging. So uh, that's definitely something new. So let, walk me a little bit through the methodology and then what results you got, if you want to give us, our listeners, an idea. Sure. Asa? Yeah. We, uh, so this is a, you know, as a level one trauma center, St. Louis University has uh, an incredible trauma registry. So the registry was just curated for uh, the CBT codes associated with uh, transverse process fractures. We excluded cervical TP fractures because those are known to be a little bit more dangerous and can kind of be associated with instability of the C-spine. So that's why we focused on the thoracolumbar spine. And so it's a very time-intensive study that took a couple years to complete, but we're looking at patients from 2012 to 2018 um, going through their imaging, uh, their trauma CT pan scans and dedicated spine imaging, uh, trying to assess if there was any additional spine injury in addition to a transverse process fracture that was called upon 
by our radiology colleagues. Um, and so that's kind of the background as far as assessing the actual injuries. And then over that uh, course, you know, we found or only found five other quote unquote missed injuries by our radiology colleagues um, in the thoracolumbar spine, which were all treated non-operatively, which kind of lends more to the stability of these injuries that that 2008 paper also um, had data to support. Um, and then just adding a spin on it, um, you know, from a resident perspective, getting these consults was, especially in the middle of the night when you're busy on a polytrauma call or whatever, is um, can be a difficult situation with a trauma team looking for answers, et cetera. And kind of wanted to see what the cost to the patient actually was for us to see them without, as Dr. Place had mentioned previously, really doing much for them. But that led us down the cost analysis route. And it was really just talking to our billing department as well as uh, the ED billing department and the trauma billing department as far as how they code our consultation and a surgical service seeing this traumatic injury, um, which from a cost analysis standpoint is uh, very pricey per patient. What, one of the things that kind of helped us identify this in isolated costs is we would be able to, uh, so uh, the CPT codes initially had a code for transverse process fractures. 22305, um, would be a code that you could use for treating it. And so that would be your CPT code for treating uh, like, a, like a body fracture would be 22310. You have a transverse process fracture code, which would be 22305. So there'd be a code, a, uh, a, a note for, in your consultation charge for this. And, and we realized that this is this was just cost prohibitive or should be cost prohibitive for wasting time. Um, and moving forward, that, that kind of helped us identify a number of these patients. So I understand in terms of the results, you had 228 patients that ultimately fit the inclusion criteria, and only five of them had lesions undiagnosed or, or misread by the radiologist. So those are not those are those are either fractures in different spinal segments or maybe a vertebral body fracture that was missed in the CT scan, but it was those are not actually cases where the TP fracture itself was implicated in whatever pathophysiology of the disease that ended up requiring a brace uh, or any other treatment, correct? Correct. 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 So uh, one of the things that, that caught my attention and I was initially thinking about how generalizable these findings were is that one of the exclusion criteria were patients with um, uh, immobilization of the lower limbs or any other um, changes in neuro status, which prevent a full neurological exam. So I thought initially that maybe there was a selection bias and maybe your whole sample ended up selecting just those patients without severe polytrauma. But looking at the series, I think your median hospital stay um, was around between seven and nine days. So I do think that you capture the bulk of the, those patients with polytrauma and who are at a high risk of other injuries. Am I correct? I think you're very correct. I think one of the reasons that we excluded those that we couldn't get an exam on is we didn't want to um, assure that we weren't missing other things uh, on those patients. Now, we looked at their CTs, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing folks who, for some other reason, had a neurologic deficit that maybe we should have been looking someplace else. Maybe that TP fractures associated with an epidural hematoma or some you know, massive other injury uh, there. So uh, that, that's part of the reason some of those got excluded, but all those studies were looked at and, again, uh, did not identify any others. And I understand in this uh, analysis, which encompassed six years, the average additional cost for the spine surgery consultation and whatever further imaging or treatment required was about $2,500. And it, 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 the total um, uh, uh, costs of this throughout these years was a million seven hundred twenty-five dollars. 
So if we break down that, I found interesting that the vast majority of this cost, um, maybe 70 to 80% was related to this, to the fact that uh, these are cases that are coded as a level three trauma because they require a, a surgical consultation and they would otherwise not qualify for that, for the coding. Is that correct? That's correct. When I talked to uh, the ED billers, this like level three trauma classification, which is just, you know, not a life or limb threatening injury or whatever. Um, but once you consult a spine or a surgical service for evaluation, they, it classifies as a level three. And it's uh, when I was digging for that information a couple of years ago, it was $12,000 flat fee per patient. So that's a that's a, um, a bad incentive for a hospital to be able to use. And, and I'm not saying it's used intentionally. I, I think there's some justifications for that. Um, but the fact that you can transform um, a ground level fall in a level three trauma and add that billing because of a surgical consultation, I think that is something in, in terms of the operational of the operation of the whole system that, that it's a little bit problematic. Um, do you agree, Dr. Place? I do, I do uh, there. The, the other part of the cost estimate, um, Dr. Mate, is that it really didn't take into account delays and time still in an emergency department uh, for those evaluations. It did take into account uh, delays in mobilizing patients uh, there and, and the other impact on, on folks there and so I, I think our cost estimates are really pretty low um, there uh, when you when you look at um, the challenge. But if you add that level three trauma, that certainly does make up for that. But that but that's part of the the process, right? You had a level three trauma and it costs there, but also there's the additional cost of leaving them immobile, leaving them in bed, um, and what those uh, what that also leads to. So. I think we're. I think our cost estimates are a little bit on the low side. It may, it may be hard to quantify those variables, right? Uh, how can you quantify it's very hard the to quantify. diverted attention from a resident who's seeing a polytrauma and at the same time he has two or three TP fractures to evaluate overnight? I mean, how does it, how does that affect how does that affect patient care overall? And even in terms of immobilization, I mean, maybe one or two DVTs that could happen because of patient being immobilized for. 12 or 24 hours uh, until they get spinal clearance, maybe a problem that uh, overwhelms any possible benefit in the whole cohort of patients, right? I, uh, I totally agree, especially when you look at the fact that none of them uh, had uh, significant missed injuries. And I understand the whole justification about the TP fractures being um, a surrogate marker for other fractures. In some sense, it, it, I understand the justifications, but we don't get, for example, um, CTs of the head for patients without head trauma just because they had um, a CT of the abdomen demonstrating a fracture and that tells it's a high energy trauma and therefore there could be something in the brain. So extrapolating the possibility of injury somewhere else because there's a fracture. It's something that I think you're trying to fix a problem of, of related to the reading of the fractures themselves and try to um, find other surrogate markers. But at the end of the day, I, I think the problem is still there. And if you have to get 228 CT scan to find five fractures, which all of them are non-operative, it does seem to me that there's an opportunity for cost op optimization in this situation. Our, our study would suggest that uh, we strongly agree. What do you think are the next steps, Dr. Place? Because I understand that I mean, it's very good to have all this data analysis with the, the institutional experience and, and especially with the, with the cost analysis. What are the next steps? And, and that serves as an advice for those who are listening and they may realize, oh, I work in a level one trauma center and that's the, we have the same situation. What are the next steps, for example, for example, here at SLU in order to persuade our trauma colleagues and to implement the institutional changes we need in order to, to, to be more uh, coherent with the findings uh, of the study? 
I think the next steps for us are going to include uh, disseminating this information better. Uh, we talked about the challenge with that earlier reference. Really, it wasn't, uh, you know, nobody seemed to pay attention to the fact that this was unnecessary, but it continued. I think we need to get that out to our colleagues again to realize this doesn't require surgical um, intervention, doesn't require a surgical consultation um, there. And I think if we're able to be successful at that, we may actually be able to show that we can uh, uh, reduce some length of stays. And I understand that this, this is somewhat a, a defensive medicine approach, right? I mean, if you if you show this, and someone may argue that in the past there was a diagnosis of an unstable sacral fracture associated with a TP fracture, the bottom line is that based on this data, it, it's not a cost-effective study to diagnose injuries somewhere else. Yeah, I th I think the um the the injury you're looking at specifically is an isolated. L5 transverse process fracture. But a CT scan that shows an isolated L5 TP fracture usually picks up the sacral fracture at the same time. And just to highlight to our listeners, I mean, we're, we're, we're not talking about TP fractures which involve the facet joint or other findings. TP fractures, which are also, are also associated with an increase in the interspinous process distance. So in this case, I think you you were able to isolate only those TP fractures not associated with any other signs of instability, correct? Correct. Correct. Anything else you would like to highlight to our listeners? No, just uh, I want to thank uh, NAS for the opportunity to uh, present our work and for you to be able to let us have a chance to discuss how important we think it is. Thank you very much, Dr. Place and Dr. Peterson. We appreciate you submitting your research to NASJ and we look forward to further research from the orthopedic department as submitted to the jury. Great, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Dr. Day. Yeah.